acts are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you, his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of the prophecy. Amen. Heavenly Father, I ask for your spirit to be present in this word for the radical solution that you have laid down is the radical solution that we would struggle to call ourselves. But I ask for your wisdom and for your grace and for your understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. If there was one thing that we can agree on while we learn in maybe different ways and while we may reach the same conclusion in some key areas, um, we could maybe process this personally in our own unique way. I would say that there are some things that we could all agree on, right? That we drive on the correct side of the road in this country. All right, that everyone needs, right, that this is good, this is good, we all agree this, that everyone needs food and water to live on, uh, that all babies are beautiful when they're asleep, all right, all right we all agree this, that uh, a gluten-free diet, no, no, we don't agree on that, all right, um, that, that all Christians vote Republic, no, Democrat, no, hang on, hang on, I got this wrong. Um, that the Samsung S8, no, the iPhone, man, I, I had a list of all these things that we agreed on. It seems that maybe we don't agree on all the things, even though we have all these facts, even though we have all this data. So today, we're supposed to look at probably one of the most difficult things, the difference between what's right and what's wrong, and agree on this not over food and politics and technology, because everyone knows that that changes every day, right? But I'm talking about the big things of life, what's right and what's wrong, the justice and judgment, which is what Revelation 19 and 20 alludes to. Is it fair, is the question. When all is said and done, will we say this was right? Why did Jesus pick? the radical solution. And that's what this message is called, the radical solution. The radical call of Jesus that he's laying down to us is this radical solution. But first, and this is for you, for some of you, I can see that you're brand new today and you haven't been here for the series. And for those of you who've been here before, you, you know this really well, we're gonna go through this. I'm gonna state a sentence to you. I'm going to then uh, repeat the sentence. I'm gonna show you this sentence on the screen. I'm gonna repeat it and you're gonna repeat it with me. And I'm gonna just explain these three rules to you because Revelation is very complex. 
and I think these are three important rules that I do at the beginning of all this series so that you understand where I'm coming from and we do this together. So, I, first rule is this. I will pace myself. You're going to see this on the screen now. We're going to repeat this together. Ready? I will pace myself. Did somebody say something entirely different? I was like, that was weird. I thought it was Jordan. No. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, just, just checking like seven weeks. Okay, all right. So I'll pace myself because I think it's very important when it comes to Revelation that you don't feel the need to actually understand everything instantly. You should resist that urge. Second is this, I will enjoy the journey. And so you'll see this, I will enjoy the journey. And you should, because this book is supposed to be about Jesus, which it is, and it's a revelation to Jesus, from Jesus to us, so you're supposed to enjoy this book. Third, this was true then, and it is true now. This was true then, and it is true now. And it is very important for us to remember that it is applicable then and is applicable now. So, let's pull out our worship guides. Uh, this is the thing that you received when you came in. And if you don't have a copy, uh, we can make sure you got one. Anybody need a copy of the worship guide? We're good? Great. All right. So, worship guides, turn over to the first page here. Uh, you'll see some recalibrate questions. And the very first recalibrate question, these are the questions that we're going to go through the message today here, is this. When was the last time you chose a radical solution? A radical solution. When was the last time you chose option A? Option A is the radical solution. And I have to ask this question, and, and, and I mentioned option A, because it seems to me that we avoid it most of the time. Option A. We avoid the radical solution most of the time. The biblical narrative, when I think of the Bible, it's constantly drawing us back to option A. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, they are creative beings. They're envel enveloped in love. And they see this universe constantly expanding. Planet Earth is just one of many. I know you'd like to imagine that we are the center of the universe, but there's many more. Humans, just one of many. I know again, you'd like to imagine we're the only people out there. The ability to create life. God, the Father, Spirit, and Son, they love the idea of creating life. Satan, however, one of the created messengers, angels, uh, he throws a huge spanner into the works, which we have very nicely called sin. Right? And this is the basic premise of sin. So this is kind of like a 101. I think it's really important. He says, love? What? What a joke. The three of you, Father, Son, and Spirit, you think you can create humans? Give them more power than you give to me, uh, an angel, the head angel? Allow them to create life? Allow them to exist forever, allow them to choose to love you, allow them to do this because you love them, no way, there's no way, they will only love you because you're powerful, they'll love you because they're scared of you, they will not choose to love you. And Satan has taken that premise that love cannot be enough. And he has forced that way all the way. Hence, his job has always been to destroy the character of God. And character is an interesting word, and we wrestle through that, and there are other ways to phrase it. It's the image of God, or the face of God, or, or what we know of God, to make us believe that God will force us. So, when we talk about sin being the separation from God, what we really mean underneath all of this is that it hurts God. Sin ruins the face of God. That's what sin does. Sin ruins the face of God. He suffers, we suffer, everyone suffers. Now here's the thing. The Godhead, they knew this. And they could have chosen option B, option C, option D, all the way to Z, but they choose option A, radical solution. And this book, this book, the Bible, this book is full of the character of God. This book is just basically showing us 
the face of God, and it can be seen in its full beauty. And we all love option A. We all do. We love it when it works out. But, but we kind of hesitate because option A is really difficult. Now, when you, when you watch movies, and I know that some of you do watch movies and some of you pretend you don't watch movies, but that's fine. When we watch movies, uh, we love it when the nerd you know, has the courage to ask the, you know, the girl out, right? We, we really appreciate that. Uh, and we, we appreciate when it works out because that means if the girl says yes, it's the radical solution, it worked out. I was sharing the story with, uh, with Angelina uh, and Miguel this week because they're, they're the kind of the same age that Becky and I were when we got married. And it was, uh, it was the very first week of school uh, of a quarter and, um, and I was sitting in this class called Early Prophets. Uh, Becky had just arrived at school from Walla Walla University to England to Newbold College. And, uh, and so uh, she was at Newbold College pretending to study, uh, but really using it as a base to travel around Europe. So she, she had just arrived in class, and as she looked at all the options, somehow she ended up with a general elective and ended up in a religion class. My blessing, she ended up in early prophets of all classes, right? So I'm sitting in the, uh, the middle left section, and she's, she walks into the middle right section. And, uh, and I, she walked in, uh, beginning the first week, I thought, this is going to be a great quarter. This is a, this is good. It's a, it's a beautiful day, and this is a beautiful sight. So it's good. So the class is over, and she leaves the class. And as she's leaving, I have before me option A, B, C, D to Z, right? Do I choose option A, the radical solution, right? Or do I choose option B, C, D to Z, which is the natural way of most men? I choose option A. I go up to her and I say, and this is the first time I go up to her and I say, by the way, I, I, I think that your hair, it looks fantastic, and you know, the shirt you're wearing is great, and the trousers are really good, but the shoes, oh, so ugly. Just, just they don't go, you just, they don't match, you know? They don't go really well, it just really doesn't match with what you're wearing. It worked, 23 years later, you know, because honesty said with a good heart, it works. The risk is really good, and the courage is really good. So the problem is that we often choose option B, C, D, E, because we like to play it safe, right? And we miss out on the possibility simply because we are not brave enough, simply because we're not brave enough to engage. And this, my friends, is nothing new, nothing new. I won't tell you the other stories that happened afterwards where I was not brave enough to really ask her out. Uh, this was just the first conversation. Later on, it was very much option D, E, and F. Uh, the A was just the beginning, but anyway. The Bible, though, is full of stories of doubt and hesitation, all right? People were never really brave enough all the time, and they, they kind of like held back, and they were always kind of scared, and they, they kind of doubted this. I want you to look up uh, one of these stories. It's Matthew chapter 11, uh, page 905 in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 11. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Jesus had just completed uh, um, one of the, the Sermon on the Mount there, and uh, he completed all the training uh, of his disciples, and John the Baptist was now in prison. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was, all right? John the Baptist knew who Jesus was even when John the Baptist was in his mother's womb. And Jesus was in his mother's womb. So Jesus is inside Mary, and, he, and Mary walks in the room. Martha is in, is John the Baptist is inside Martha, and, 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 and walks in the room. And literally, the, John the Baptist recognizes Jesus. You can read about this inside the gospel, inside the womb. I mean, when, he, when Jesus arrives at the place, he doesn't say, behold the Lamb of God. He's like, I, I don't know if you are the Lamb of God. I'm kind of, are you the one? He's no doubt at all, right? So this, the context is important. He knows who this is. This is what happens in Matthew chapter 11, page 905. Verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his disciples, he went away from their teaching and preaching in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples, and he said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered, Go tell John what you hear and see. 
The blind receive the sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised and the poor have good news to preach. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The truth is this, all right, is that it wasn't John who was doubting. His disciples were doubting around him. They're like, John, how come you're in prison? How come this Messiah hasn't rescued you? And they kind of put the seed in him. So he said, all right, go go ask Jesus, are you the one, right? People doubt. People have questions. They are looking for option A, kind of, but they're really an option B, C, D kind of person inside there. The Jews were this way as well. They wanted a Messiah who would rescue them from Rome. The kingdom he was bringing wasn't the kingdom they were looking. Because the radical solution always shifts our paradigm. It always does this. The radical solution always does this. It's supposed to make you think something different. It's supposed to make you move somewhere in some other way. And this is important. It is the unexpected. It is the unlikely route, and it is not of this world. It is the unexpected, it is the unlikely route, and it's not of this world. So the way of Jesus is unlike anything you've ever imagined. You have to keep focused on the long-term results. When people follow Jesus, their lives are transformed. And you have to look at our planet, and you have to look at the history of our planet, and you have to say to yourself, man, it's, it's actually kind of a horrible history because we have a history of kind of destroying and oppressing ourselves. We even have the audacity to, to sometimes even say that we do it in the name of Jesus. But the truth is that if you look at what Jesus says, we're not doing it in the name of Jesus. We're just cloaking ourselves in the name of Jesus. I know, I know. You say, but we kind of got it now. We've learned our lessons. I mean, did we? Really? I mean, how many lessons do we have to learn? How many times do we have to go through this? We say to Jesus, we give him a hard time for grace, do we? Because we say to Jesus, we, we kind of got it right now. And I ask you, do we really get this? I mean, with Syria, do we really get this? With Iraq, wouldn't that have been enough? With Vietnam, hasn't that been enough? With Korea, hasn't that been enough? With World War II and World War I, hasn't that been enough? With the American Civil War, hasn't that been enough? With the French and the Spanish and the Germans, with the Japanese and Rwandas and the Tutsis and Florida and LA and our cities and our schools and our streets and our towns, hasn't it been enough? How many more ways do we need to learn? And Jesus knows this. As we said last week, the intense pain that we experience is pain that Jesus does. So by the time we get to Revelation now of 1920, John is getting ready to reveal the radical solution finale. This is what chapters 19 and 20 is about. And this is pretty amazing as you get into chapter 19, which Kevin read for us, uh, the, the opening verses there. It is kind of interesting, and because this is the only place that this happens. In the entire Bible, um, the word hallelujah, the word hallelujah only appears 28 times. You would think that it appears a lot more because there's a lot to praise God for, right? But hallelujah only appears 28 times. And it appears um, only at the end after the Day of Atonement celebration has taken place. So you understand this, that the Day of Atonement is where we, we celebrate in the First Testament the sin is forgiven and it's ended. Then Jesus says, well, I know I've forgiven you, but now symbolically, I'm going to remove that memory of that sin from the camp. So a, a, a ram was taken from the camp and removed from the campsite. And they would then, there were seven psalms that they would go through, and they would sing hallelujah as the ram was removed from the camp. So these psalms are the only psalms where the word hallelujah in the entire Bible is used. Now there is one other place in the whole Bible where the word hallelujah is used. And that happens to be Revelation chapter 19 that Kevin read for us. And that's the only other place that it's used. Four times out of the 28 times that word is used inside there. 
Because it is a celebration that something amazing has happened, that judgment has been done, that the world's been transformed, and we are about to celebrate this incredible finale that's taken place, the radical solution finale. In fact, you, you get to see this great, ride, this great rider on a white horse that comes through, and, and he has a sword, and some people will often imagine immediately, oh, the rider is on a, ho a horse, and he has a sword, and the sword must be in his hand, but the text says that the sword is actually in his mouth, symbolically implying that the text saying that the sword being in his mouth means that this is a spiritual battle that he has won and he's overcome. And we get to chapter 20. And chapter 20 brings us to question number two. It's 14 very punchy verses. Question number two, which is this. What is the thousand years all about? What is a thousand years? What are the thousand years all about? In the daily walk, I break down the chapter into four sections, chapter 20, into four sections. And we don't have a lot of time today to break all this down. So you can read the daily walk, and you can break down the entire judgment inside there so you can actually understand what it's all about inside there. And it's great. But let me give you the kind of the bottom line of this chapter 20 so you can kind of take the radical solution finale here. Here's a summary. We will have questions, naturally. We're going to have this. We will have questions. What about so-and-so, all right? Why are they not in heaven? What about so-and-so? And Jesus wants us to understand this. Jesus wants to understand that everybody, everybody has had a choice. And Jesus did not reject anyone. Jesus just followed through based on their choice. So, let's go to the text. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, page 1142. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Page 1142 in your Bibles. Then I saw thrones, remember this is a symbolic language, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This verse here talks about these thrones and talks about all those who have been beheaded, all those who are going to, who have not received the, the mark of the beast, those who have actually been faithful to God, those who have been saved, and they all get thrones. In other words, he's describing heaven and saying, everybody saved gets a throne. I mean, if you imagine heaven literally, and this is what it was, we just have heaven full of golden thrones. It'd be kind of weird, right, if it was literal, that every single person would have their own throne. It'd be very uncomfortable for a thousand years to be sitting on a golden throne. I mean, just unless it was a very comfortable, soft gold and just kind of like, you know, concave or with a cushion, and like leaning back. But a thousand years, I mean, literally. So it, the symbolic language is very important. And the reason it's important is this, because you may remember if you were here early in a series, and you may know this if you've studied this before, when we got to Revelation 4 and 5, when Jesus got to grab hold of the scroll and the symbolic nature of grabbing hold of the scroll and the New T First Testament and the power of the scroll and sitting on the throne with the Father and the authorities, that the throne represents authority and that as he comes together, the authority is on the throne, that they become together, they are co-creators, they become in charge together. So Jesus is saying, I am bringing you all of you who are saved, and I'm giving you authority to judge with me on the throne. You are here, part of this. So now everyone has a throne. This is crazy. Option A is a radical solution. Come sit with me, and let's go through this together for this thousand-year period, this, this symbolic period of time. For eternity, Jesus wants us to be settled he wants us to see the face of God, and he wants us, yes, us, to join him. Now, this is kind of crazy, right? But there is a deep track record in the whole Bible for this. Just think about this. 
All right? This is not new. The Bible's full of stories where Jesus is constantly skipping option B, C, D, E, Z, and God is always going for option A. Always the most unlikely radical choice. Always the risky one, which makes you think, what? Really? What? You would pick that one? I mean, he gives, he gives Abraham and Sarah, and he says, you guys can't have kids, but I'm going to give you the chance to become parents on the line of the Messiah. He says, he calls Moses, you're a murderer, and you stutter, but I'm going to make sure you lead a million people out of slavery and lead them into the promised land. He says to Samuel, you little boy, I'm going to help you grow up, and you're going to become a prophet that transitions the king through the most difficult period of time into the king that's actually going to become the line that the Messiah will come from. He says to the prisoner, Daniel, you will become number two in over two different empires. And then when he comes to earth and becomes this baby boy and grows up to become this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, he says, those who have no family, I'll make you my family. He takes the dirty dozen and he makes this 30 dozen become the disciples who actually form the movement that we belong to today. But let me, let me put a little pin in this thought just so that you remember this. If you wanted to be anybody in Jesus' day, as a male in Jesus' day, you wanted to be a rabbi. And you trained until the age of 12, you took your exams. This was like the exam of all exams. And if you failed those exams, you became a stonemason a carpenter, a fisherman, a tax collector, anything but not a rabbi. So that's why when Jesus is 12 years old in the temple and he's speaking, they're like, boy, which rabbi school do you go to? I want to know because you are definitely going to be a rabbi. But all these 12 that he picks, they all fail the rabbinical school. So they get to be picked. And Jesus says, well, you're the unlikely, you're the radical A solution. I'm picking you and I'm going to make you these people. Jesus cared for children when nobody else did. Because in that time, temple prostitution was so high, so many kids were born that they were just running around like rag rats. Nobody cared for them, but Jesus said, suffer the little children, bring them to me. Jesus invited women to be part of his disciples, to be in his inner circle. Did you know, in fact, that the women actually paid most of the bills for Jesus' ministry? Did you? Let's uh, read that text, because you don't believe me about that one. All right. It's in Luke, chapter 8. I know, they're like, I believe everything else, but uh, that one's a little bit weird. Uh, Luke, chapter 8, uh, page 958. You're like, I'm going to get my pen and underline this one. Luke, chapter 8, I knew women shouldn't be ordained. All right, Luke, chapter 8, page uh, 958. And it just, it, this is just amazing, because I think sometimes we, 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 we kind of want to discard this kind of stuff, but another great text that just shows you the, the phenomenal presence of how women were essential for ministry inside here. So we read this text, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Huh. Yeah. What's out of their means mean? Oh. Pretty sure that means that they paid for everything. All right. So who were these people? Well, we know who Mary Magdalene was because she was the, the, the lady who Jesus had saved from the stoning stuff. But Joanna, who was she? Well, she was the wife of Chusa. Chusa was the one who actually ran the household of Herod. Herod is the one in Luke chapter 13 who's going to say, I want to kill Jesus. So let me get this right. Herod has a guy who is in charge of all of his money who runs all the A-list parties. He is, by the way, the wealthiest person in the whole of Galilee. He runs all the A-list parties in the whole of Galilee. And his wife, who goes to all these A-list parties, pays for Jesus' ministry? Yes, that's the same person. Jesus calls people from all unlikely places and creates so many radical solutions. All right, one final example. Noah, you guys heard of that guy? Yeah? 
Yes. Just checking. I was, like, I, was, I was like, I don't know which church I'm in. Noah. Uh, celebrating the dawning of a new era. You know why? Flood? Good, okay. You're like, it's a trick question. <laughs> Does something happen to Noah? Yes, he survived the flood. Great. So he's celebrating this, and of course, as you, as you would, if you had survived a flood, what would you do if you had not a lot of food? You would go plant potatoes and corn. No, he plants a vineyard. Uh, and so he plants a vineyard, and he gets drunk. Uh, and as a result of getting drunk, something happens, a horrible thing happens with Ham. I mean, why would you name your son Ham? I mean, if you name your son Ham, something terrible is going to happen anyway. But, uh, but something terrible happens with his son Ham and uh, with Noah, all right? And so as a result of this, he curses his son and curses his son and his son's son as well. So let's read this uh, fantastic story. It's in Genesis chapter 9, page 8, uh, beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 9, verse 24. Genesis chapter 9, verses 24 to 29. Page 8 in your Bibles in the pew. When Noah awoke from his wine... Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe his fault, and knew what his young son had done to him. He said, Curse be Canaan, a servant of his servants shall he be to his brothers. And he said also, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. I think when he meant enlarge, he didn't mean as large as that. But And let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And after the flood lived 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. The story here basically says this, all right? You will be cursed, Ham, and your son, Canaan, will be cursed. And so will all your descendants will be cursed because of this evil that you had done. And this is significant, this idea, and I don't want you to forget this, and this will be a sermon other, some other time here. Um, there are generational issues that we don't address sometimes as families. There are generational issues that we, as men and women, don't address about who we are. And you need to face up to your past because you need to shape the present for a stronger future, all right? And this is something we will have to talk to later on in this year here, but you need to face up to your past because you need to shape the present for a stronger future. I want you to remember this text here because there are serious consequences if you don't address what has happened in your past. Canaan is cursed here. If you scroll down the text now, just continue down here on page uh, chapter 10, and you go down to chapter 10, verse 15. Canaan, he fathered Sidon. This is chapter 10, verse 15. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. I love these names. All right. Canaan had a son called Sidon. Sidon is going to become a great nation. That nation is going to appear all through the Bible. All right. Lock this away. And I'm going to fly through this. Judges chapter 10, the Sidians, they're going to oppress Israel. First king, Solomon, he's going to marry quite a few women from Sidon. Uh, and they're going to lead Solomon to worship a goddess called Ashtoreth. Second kings, Ahab is going to marry a princess. The princess is going to be from the lion of Sidon. Her name is going to be Jezebel. Isaiah 23 is going to describe the Sidians and say to us that these are a despicable people and they will never have the evil leave from them. Jeremiah chapter 25 and 47 is going to say that, declare that there will be no end and no help for Sidon. Ezekiel chapter 27 and 28 and 32 says that they are an uncircumcised and, and disgraceful people. So these Sidians were not loved. Do you understand that? They're not loved. They've been cursed from Ham all the way through the entire First Testament. They are not loved by anybody. Along comes Jesus. Along comes the man of Nazareth. Along comes the Messiah. Along comes the root of Jesse. And along comes the king that we know who can change your past and turn you around. And in Mark chapter 7, Jesus goes to Sidon. Radical solution. In Matthew 15, Jesus is talking with a Sidonian and is amazed by their faith. 
radical solution. In Luke, Sidonians come to Jesus and he heals loads of them. And in Matthew 11, Jesus says that the Sidonians have more faith than any of the Jews around him. Radical solution. Jesus works with everyone and it doesn't matter what your past is. So Jesus is about the present and the future. And Jesus will transform your life. And Jesus will call the most unlikely people. So he will come and share the review of the judgment. Do you see this full circle coming together now in Revelation chapter 20? Because I need you to understand what's going on here. When Jesus invites us to review every single reason why so-and-so is not in heaven and why so-and-so is in heaven, you're going to be asking yourself, how are you qualified And why would Jesus give you that authority to let you go through this process? Who are we to be involved? Liars, adulterers, thieves, and cursed. Yet Jesus says, I am giving you the opportunity to be this because I want you to be at peace with the choices that everyone has made. That's why it's a radical solution. It is unheard of. That's why we who are created beings, are called to sit on the throne with the Creator. That's why we, as humans, get to ask the question, why? Could it be now, could it be now, that Jesus has some deeper lessons about the kingdom of God that we could apply today? Maybe. Question three. What hidden potential are you or the church overlooking? perhaps from younger people or those less experienced. I gotta tell you this, that it is actually hard to admit that we are wrong sometimes, and it's hard to admit that someone who is younger, less experienced, less knowledge, might have a better idea or vision of a way forward, right? It's hard to admit that someone who has made mistakes, someone who's just begun, someone who's new to faith, might have a better idea or vision of the way forward for life or church. It's hard to admit that someone who is not a member, someone who's never led, someone who's just simply excited about Jesus might have a better idea or a vision of a way forward. Yet, my friends, this has never stopped Jesus. It stops us. Sexism, racism, ageism, intellectualism, faithism, The list can go on forever, and they all revolve around one central issue, the inability to see Jesus in other people. I don't know how many times we avoid bringing others into a conversation because of their generation, or because of their race, or their gender, or because of their different opinion here, but there's this great story in Luke chapter 15, our final text for this morning, that I want us to end on. In Luke chapter 15, page 969 in your Bibles, and I need you to read this text with me. It's a famous story. You may have read this many times. If you're new to the Bible, then this may be a first time you're coming to this story. So uh, a guy is very comfortable, happy at home, and seems all okay. Luke chapter 15, page 969. And lacks for nothing. And uh, yet he goes to his father, and he asks his father to give him everything of his inheritance and let him go, and he leaves. And then eventually, you know, because his father says to him, well, choice is the essence of love, right? Choice is the essence of love, just like God gives us choice because he loves us, lets us go. But when he realizes all that he is and all that he is without his father, he goes back to his father because he realizes the story that's been told about his father is not true. The lies that God, that Satan has told about God are not true. So he wants to return to his father. So Luke chapter 15, Verse 20 says this, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. (laughs) And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fat and calf and kill him and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. While he was a far way off, the father ran towards him. For us in Boulder, running is nothing, right? But if you saw me running, you know that'd be pretty serious, right? It would be. You know a miracle had happened. 
And I tell you this, that um, we need to find a way to run as a church. We need to find a way to run as a church. We need to find a way as a church to run towards people, not to wait for people to run towards us. We need to find a way to see them from a far way off and run to them. And when they come and we run to them, we need to throw a robe around them and a ring on them and a shoes on them. In other words, we need to welcome them right away. We need to celebrate them right away and we need to embrace them right away. There's no long evaluation period. There's no like, let's check out to see if this is okay. Let's just welcome you home and let's just embrace you because you belong to the family of God. And this is kind of a, a radical idea and it's a radical solution because he was lost and he's found. She was lost and she was found. We are lost and we are found and we are found in Jesus. This is what it's about. So the final question that we have today in your worship guide, I want you to actually answer in your Connect card if you want to. You're welcome to fill out your Connect card, place it in the altars that are around here. What can you see Jesus changing in your life and your community? If you want some help to be able to process that, then fill in the Connect card and we will help you process that question. What can you see Jesus changing in your life or in your community? The time for a radical solution, an option A, is today. Not next week, not tomorrow, it's today. The opportunity is for us today. And Jesus is saying that there's going to be one great day up ahead in Revelation 20 when we get the opportunity by his incredible graciousness to sit with him, by his mercy and kindness, and understand why every decision has ever been made so that we may live a life of eternity in peace. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this gracious word that has been protected and preserved that we get to read and the freedom in this space. God, for the transformative power that it is in our lives, God, for the challenging word that it is, may we have the courage to follow option A in our lives, to do the radical solutions in our lives, Lord. May we have the ability to be able to follow you wherever you call us. We ask this in Jesus' most beautiful and precious name. Amen.